Uh, hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Today we have Akaki from uh, Offchain Labs Research coming to talk about his uh, recent research, buying time, latency versus bidding and transaction ordering. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us, Akaki. We're really happy to have you today. Yeah, uh, take it away. So thank you for the invitation. So welcome to this presentation. So this is a joint work together with uh, Mahimna Kelkar, who is PhD student at Cornell University. Jan Christoph Schlegel, who is a senior lecturer at City University of London, and he recently joined Flashbots company. And Edward Felton, who is co-founder and uh, chief scientist at Offchain Labs, where I'm working as a research scientist. Okay, so motivation is uh, one of the biggest questions, in my opinion, about uh, in blockchains. This is transaction transaction ordering policy. And we know that in the tra traditional finance applications, they keep order books of buy and sell orders. And all, all of them by default or by even by law are obliged to have first come first serve uh, policy. So they are executing transactions as, as they come or if, if it's a um, limit order transaction, then they need to wait, but they will always execute uh, the transaction that came the first, if it is possible to execute. And in case of uh, roll-up protocols, so roll-up protocols for those who don't know, try to scale the base layer. And in case of Ethereum, uh, uh, I'm talking about Arbitrum, that's the main product of Opchain Labs, this optimistic roll-up. We are also using first come, first serve transaction ordering policy. So there is a sequencer that orders transactions as they come by their time and uh, executes them or passes it for the execution stage in this order. Now we know that in base layer situation is different and uh, they use uh, blocks, block approaches, and that's why they are called blockchains. So they the transactions contain bits and there is some designated block creator in every round, in every uh, instance of block creation. And there is also some mempool of transactions, of publicly visible transactions that is called mempool. And then the next block writer just chooses a set of transactions for the next block. And then they somehow reach a consensus about the uh, block. So there are different ways how to, to reach consensus, but main idea is that either miners or proposers or block writers or block creators, there are many different names, they decide uh, how to choose the transactions in the block and they also choose how to order them. And especially because there are now financial ap applications deployed on the blockchains or at least the blockchains that support smart contracts, uh, there is a lot of incentive to have uh, your transaction early or maybe late, depending on what is the intent. And this uh, transaction ordering policy gives a lot of power to the block creators. But in case of uh, roll-ups, we know that it's first come, first serve, or at least that's the promise by the sequencer. And uh, in, in case of Arbitrum, it, it is kept. And in, in case of other roll-ups, I also believe, or at least it's also easy to detect if there is some, uh, that the sequencer tries to violate this policy. Okay, so there are a lot of advantages to first come, first serve. It's simplest uh, ordering policy, and it's also yeah, easy to explain to users, and you, it um, also seems intuitively fair. Whoever is faster gets a transaction executed faster. And there is nothing that um, has lower latency because it just need, needs to reach the sequencer, and then requ uh, sequencer can tell uh, about this to the transaction center. So any other ordering policy has some delay, and we know that in blockchains there are many seconds of delay for the uh, block creation. But there is a disadvantage also, otherwise we would not be trying to design different policies. And uh, it is very well known in the traditional finance field, and there is a huge industry around it. It's called high frequency trading. And uh, that policy creates the latency competition 
and a, a lot of institutions and independent players invest to have low latency because it, uh, for the arbitrage searchers it matters that their uh, transaction is uh, fast enough so this high frequency trading is so big that it even constitutes to more than half of the exchange volume so there are references to this in case of blockchains it was uh, in my opinion acknowledged too late and there is this paper by Diane and co-authors called Flash Boys 2.0 which looks uh, to this well-known minor extractable value and documents the uh, front running and back running and all, all kinds of uh, attacks by miners and uh, other players and the problem for the consensus layer also because in case of ethereum it was a lot of uh, these priority order auctions happening and that was creating congestion so in, in, unlike the front running we see the back running so after transaction is scheduled some arbitrage seekers are trying to get their transaction uh, executed as fast as possible to uh, adjust the price or, or take advantage of the previous transaction. This we see as a positive activity and because it uh, yeah, optimizes the market, for example. So we want to support that. Okay, so in case of uh, roll-ups, we also observed in, in the context of Arbitrum that uh, there, there is a latency race in particular the players try to come closer to the sequencer because Arbitrum or rollups have one sequencer at the moment at least and uh, the parties that have this advantage to be closer to sequencer they have advantage to be scheduled as fast as possible and we see that this to be unfair but also it is inefficient and by inefficient i mean that not always the user that has the highest value for the arbitrage value get its, gets its transaction the fastest. And all this latency investment and improving the latency is a total waste from the protocol perspective because they pay, the players pay to some outside ser services to have better latency. Okay, so there is one particular example that uh, also slowed down se sequencer so the parties were creating a lot of nodes because sequencer was applying the fairest uh, feeding policy so sequencer has uh, feeding of transactions to all all the new nodes that subscribe to it and it um, feeds at random uniformly at random and if you just create more and more nodes you the, the chances that your node gets uh, feed faster is increasing but this also slows down the sequencer because if there are already hundreds of thousands of nodes uh, yeah, it, it is too slow to feed all of them okay so now how to fix this problem of latency competition so first of all we should acknowledge that it's it would be much better if the protocol could capture these resources because this would uh, this could be then used uh, so this additional revenue could be used for maintenance and improvement of the infrastructure or even can be used for subsidizing regular transaction fees so if there is some pool created from this additional revenue so one way or another this helps the protocol and uh, is not a complete waste if we can you know, monetize this but we need to come up with a transaction ordering policy that has some properties so first of all so we want to ideally make the latency racing disappear but if it's not possible to make it disappear and it's not uh, we want to reduce the uh, effect of it so we also want to keep the low latency so we want that particularly we want the property that any transaction that arrives to the sequencer is executed or scheduled to execute in the sequence within some time bound and this time bound should be as low as possible so one more maybe exotic properties independence of irrelevant transactions but let me explain what it is so we want that different latency races don't interact within with each other because this uh, complicates the strategy 
of the participants of the latency races. And more formally, it means that two transactions will be scheduled uh, rel in relative order, only depending on the properties of these transactions, and other transactions don't affect the relative order of two transactions. Ideally, we also want to decentralize the sequencer in the future, and the policy should be such that decentralization is still possible. And the uh, last property is dark mempool. So right now, sequencer sees all the contents of transactions, and ideally, nobody sees contents of transactions until they are actually scheduled. But once they are scheduled, then everyone sh should be able to see and then the race can start. So this is this back running race. And the last two properties actually are almost the same, decentralization and dark mempool. So with one sequencer, you cannot achieve dark mempool, but with multiple and uh, multiple sequencers and uh, threshold encryption schemes, it is possible. So for the, that, we need to have a committee of sequencers and threshold encryption. So let's say we have some low number of sequencers because as soon as we increase number of uh, sequencers, the latency increases. So that's why it needs to be low, but not too low. Let's say in the range of seven to 16. And we have some threshold uh, trust in them. So we trust that let's say third of them uh, are so not more than a third of them are malicious. So we trust that two thir thir thirds of them are honestly doing their job. And we assume the Byzantine fault to tolerance. Uh, so we require that from the mechanism and we assume that network is asynchronous. So this is the hardest assumptions on the problem at hand. That's why the uh, speed is very low when you increase and it, it grows at least quadratically and also it depends how uh, geographically distributed the sequencers are. So let me jump to the algorithm or the policy itself. So informal description is that it is simple and we think that it is fair and mixes uh, the beats of the transaction with the timestamp. So it takes um, in, in some sense better of the of the both worlds. So if it's only timestamp, then it's first come first serve, but we want to mix uh, the timestamp with the bid and bid is per gas or per resource unit in case of Ethereum, it's, it's called gas or in case of Arbitrum, but may, maybe there are some names in other chains. And that is uh, important. That will become later clear why it is important. Okay, so now instead of in investing all the resources into reducing the latency and improving the timestamp, players try to increase their bid and in in invest at least a fraction of their resources in the bidding. Okay, we analyze this proposal uh, from the economic perspective and it is almost equivalent to the first price all pay auction. And all pay means that even if uh, transaction sender does not like the position of its transaction, it has to pay for it. So th th there is no approach of um, block building here where you are only paying if your transaction or set of transactions are in particular order, especially against other transactions. So the so-called sandwich attack, but you pay always. You try to get as early as possible because we are only looking into this kind of arbitrage searches. So only back running opportunities, opportunities where it's uh, only about to be as fast as possible. Okay, so the, the, then the uh, proposal satisfies the economic properties of this first price all pay auctions. And it's clearly incentive compatible because more you bid earlier your transaction is scheduled. So uh, you, you will bid more. Okay, so yeah, uh, in, in these lines, if you want your transaction to be scheduled uh, earlier, you, yeah, you may um, try to have lower latency. But if the price of bidding is not too high, you prefer 
to trade the money for time, so pay for the time advantage. And so this gives a chance to those players that have lower budget to have lower latency to pay high for a particular arbitrage opportunity and still win the race, which they would never be able to win any race against large players that have low latency. Okay, so this is our economic efficiency. And also it goes against the centralization because if you have the lowest latency uh, at let's say one particular chain, then uh, you are winning, so one party is winning all the races. Okay, so here one more property that we would like to have is that there is never a transaction that has bit low amount and it's executed before another transaction that comes right after it so after a few milliseconds and beats a much higher value and this problem is a fundamental problem of block-based approaches so if you have block-based approach so you have some time interval where you are collecting all transactions and sort them in some way there are transactions that come right after block is created and they may be high, just be unlucky not to be included in the previous block and they lose the race. Okay, so then last property is we want to have um, fair treatment of unsophisticated players that beat zero. So they, they are just regular bidders who want to pay their regular gas fees and they are not contesting or um, participating into any race. and they will, so 95% of transactions, let's say, are like this, and they get uh, at most G delay. So you can never outbeat, outbeat someone who came earlier than G time unit before you. And now more formal distribution of the uh, description of the algorithm. There is some stream of transactions labeled by large T's, and each transaction has two characteristics. One is timestamp, or the arrival time to a sequencer, which we denote by TI, and bit per resource unit. So in case of arbitrum, that would be gas, that we denote by BI. Okay, so the next transaction that is posted to be executed or included in the feed for the execution is, is the one that has the highest score. And let me give you a description, what is the score function? So we translate bits into the time advantage. So if a pl player bits amount bi in, in some token, then the priority time is given by this formula. This is uh, upper bounded by G. So if you take bi goes to infinity, this is the limit is G. So you can never get more than G priority time. So C is some constant that for the analysis we set it equals to one. So you, you think uh, uh, that this is, let's say, one Ethereum. In case of Arbitrum, it would be one Ethereum. So to buy G half time, you need to pay one Ethereum in total. So that would, uh, if we, for example, uh, uh, consider swap transactions, we would divide by the amount of gas that swap transactions take. Okay, so then the score is calculated by priority times pri priority time minus the um, timestamp, and we sort the transactions uh, within sight. Uh, so we, we don't know the, uh, future transactions. So far, we see, let's say, window of length g time units with the decreasing score, and the transaction that has the lowest, um, uh, so highest score is uh, executed next. Okay, so first property that we obtain is maybe very mathematical. We obtain the result that uh, if, the, if we want the property of independence of irrelevant transactions, then the only algorithm or the class of algorithms that satisfy this property is that uh, that are based on scores. So we post 
transactions to be executed by their score only, and we don't compare um, any other global property. Okay, so this is a mathematical result. Now about the functional form of pi. Why did we take this uh, particular function? So first of all, if transaction sender pays zero, it gets zero priority, so that's normalization. We wanted uh, that maximum time priority or priority time one could buy is G. So if we take uh, X goes to infinity, so B goes to infinity, then we get to G. So you can come arbitrarily close to G, but you can never get to G. Also, of course, we want that if more bits are paid, the priority time is higher. So that's the first derivative is positive. And this is maybe more technical. We want the pri priority time to be concave in bit, which would mean that producing some priority time. So cost of producing would be convex, and that is needed to have internal solution to the equilibrium. So this is something more, more technical. But uh, yeah, this is also quite needed property. And then with these four properties, in my opinion, the function that is described here is the easiest. But if there is anything else, I'm really curious to see. Okay, so now the algorithm, the transaction that has the highest score, so has uh, um, the priority time minus timestamp or the lowest updated timestamp. So if you uh, uh, negate that, score, then you would get timestamp minus the priority time is posted the first. And um, if the transaction that algorithm posts is the earliest arrived in real time, then we move the time to the right. So the time window moves to the right. If it's not the earliest, then we still keep the time window in the same position and we just continue to posting other transactions that have lower um, score. Okay, so the complexity of this algorithm is as simple as it gets. The space complexity, it's linear. We just need to keep the transactions so we don't construct any additional data st structure around them. And the runtime is, okay, it's not the lowest possible, but it's quite low. It's n times log n. We just need to sort the transactions so we can have some priority keep structure that keeps the uh, highest score transaction in, in, in the root. And this allows us to handle tens of thousands of transactions per second. So we don't get any disadvantage from this. Because yeah, if you come up with any other algorithm, complicated algorithm, for example, graph-based algorithm about transactions, then this will uh, easily scale to n square and then you already have much much slower algorithm so let me jump to the economic analysis of this uh, proposal we have very, very simple stylized model suppose there is some arbitrage and now players need to take a decision how fast they need to respond to this arbitrage opportunity and there is some cost to have let's say average time or exact de delivery time of your uh, transaction after t time the arbitrage opportunity was there and uh, the users have some valuation to be the first so there is some value to derive and different users may have different valuation it depends how, how many assets or how much ass assets they have uh, on the chain so higher uh, liquidity means that valuation will be higher, let's say. Okay, and we have very simple model with two players that have this random valuation, so they don't know each other's valuations, but uh, they know how the valuations are distributed. Okay, so there are these distribution functions. So now the players take a decision how fast they want to react or what should be their latency, and in case of bidding, what, what should be the bid. So we assume that latency cost function is as simple as it can get. So in order to be after t time, 
your transaction to be delivered to the sequencer, you pay price CI, so it costs you CIT, which is uh, one over T, which means that if you want to be right after uh, arbitrary opportunity is there, it costs you infinity, but if you don't care and you take E equal to infinity, then you don't pay anything. And distributions are as simple as it can get. They, let's say they are just uniform, uniformly distributed on zero, one. So everything is normalized. So there are two ways to look at this. In the first, it's uh, much simpler and um, you know, yeah, much more natural assumption that players invest in the latency in advance. So before they see the arbitrage opportunity and they know what their valuation is for this opportunity, they invest in the latency in advance. And yeah, so there are different examples how you can do that, but we are abstract away from this. And in the other one, we assume that the sender can invest even in the latency after arbitrage opportunities seen, or let's say there is some arbitrage opportunity, potential arbitrage opportunity, and you can condition uh, on that with some service provider. So if that arises, then I want you to deliver. Um, so the service provider delivers the transaction with some latency and you pay for lower latency of course you pay more but in both cases the bidding uh, is assumed to be ex post decision or interim decision meaning after you know what is your valuation you decide how much to bid and that is a very realistic ass assumption okay so in the only latency investment uh, we are getting much e easier game so it's a st static game um, let's say that xi is the amount that is invested in the latency by player i and the payoffs are uh, the following so if the player wins the um, game then the payoff is expected value of a uh, arbitrage opportunity because it's not realized yet we haven't seen the uh, arbitrage opportunity minus the amount that was already invested if there is some um, pie so they uh, equal equally invest let's say there is one half probability that one of them wins so that this is the payoff in that case and if you don't win then it's ju just minus uh, x i so the investment and let's assume that there is one investment so one arbitrage opportunity or we, you can think about it as a, a, a average so here it's already actually averaged but you need to outbid in the latency competition to your competitor so your x i should be larger than x j of the player j so in this game there is no pure strategy in Nash equilibrium that's why uh, we need to focus on the mixed strategies and mixed strategy equilibrium is very simple they just uh, choose the effort level uniformly at random. And we can show that um, this is the equilibrium. I will not go in the proof because of time. But the idea is that both of them in this game have expected pay of zero, which is kind of fair and expected result. It's a perfect competition. So no party should have any advantage and they are uh, completely exhausting their resources on average so their payoffs are zero but if there is some budget constraint so you cannot invest any amount you like because you have some budget for the investment in the latency so that actually refers to the case that uh, there are weaker players that have lower budget and stronger players that have higher budget uh, again there is no pure Nash equilibrium here but there is uh, again mixed strategy equilibrium in which so there are of course um, some mixed strategies here but the main idea is that the weak agent always obtains the average pay of zero and strong agent uh, obtains some positive payoff and that gives advantage to the uh, st strong agent and this result is quite robust actually so this may be uh, equilibrium is not unique but payoffs are unique so in any mixed equilibrium you will get these payoffs okay so now 
we study the sequential game where we have some interim bidding. So once you know the um, value of the arbitrage opportunity, you decide how much to um, bid, but you know your opponent's latency. And uh, this is a reasonable assumption if the game is played repeatedly, and this is the case actually, you observe what your opponent's latency level is or how, how often it is winning. And uh, here the game is uh, much more complicated. So they invest, they have already invested in the latency technology. And in order to produce a score, sigma, you need to pay this amount. So I will not go into the formula, but uh, it uh, yeah, applies, uh, it uses the formula of uh, our, our score function. So in the equilibrium, we need to determine, depending on the valuation and on the investment levels of the latency, how much score we need to produce or how yeah, equivalently how much we should beat. And this uh, is a uh, optimization problem for both players where they need to decide on the signal or, or on the score. And this is solved by first order condition. And in the end, we get a system of differential equations. So here it becomes a bit complicated. We actually, we are not able to solve this analytically, but we still manage to obtain some observations. And let, let me go into the observations. So if in the uh, latency, both of them invested the same amount, so delta denotes the time so latency difference between these players and this delta is equal to zero. So we have symmetric case. We have a completely separating equilibrium. So which means that depending on the valuation, the bid is increasing. So bid is increasing in the valuation and you start bidding as soon as valuation is positive. So we know exactly what is the value depending on the bid. And this is very efficient. In case of asymmetric latencies, so they now one party has advantage over the other. Okay, we have partially separating equilibrium means that bidders don't bid for some low valuations, but they start bidding for high enough valuations. And actually we can identify what is the this threshold. So picture looks like this. So up to some point bidders don't bid and the party that has latency advantage, so has lower latency is always winning. But once the valuation is higher than this threshold, both of them start bidding. The advantage, to, so lower latency player bids less. So that's a blue line. And uh, the one that is disadvantaged bids slightly more. Okay, so this is the formal result. We identify what is threshold. It depends on delta and g. So this is the square root of delta over g minus delta. And yeah, so we, we know how this looks like. Okay, so now we know that in the case of the same latency, we have the standard all pay auction. This is the efficient outcome. And if there is some asymmetry in the latency, then we have, yeah, kind of inefficient outcome that for low valuations, they don't beat. So the, let's say the roll up also doesn't get any beats. But if you take G, uh, so the valuation is large enough, then uh, yeah, approximately equal signals are produced. Okay, so in, in uh, asymptotic terms. Okay, so everything now depends on the parameter G and the latency difference delta. So if G is large enough, then auction becomes approximately efficient. So if you can buy more and more time, but of course this goes against low latency, we want G to be actually quite low. And we, we will see that if G is low, then the bidding is low because the threshold is large enough. So the uh, if, the parameter, if, if the parameters are chosen 
optimally, then we can get a balance between the fairness, low latency and efficiency. So low, low latency, we want G to be low enough. Uh, fairness, we want that uh, the disadvantaged party to have mm, some chances to win. And this comes with the efficiency that we want. Uh, efficiency comes with the motivation that we want roll up to collect uh, bits more often. So of course, we can extend this analysis to more players and more general functions. And we assume that valuations are independent, but in reality, they are actually quite dependent. And But the qualitative results probably will not change. Of course, this is theoretical analysis so far, but we can get these uh, estim estimates of these um, distribution functions from the data. Another interesting thing is how to update parameters C and G. So it would be nice to have some rule that tells us how, when to increase C, especially. Let's say G is fixed to half second we're thinking about. And it would be also in, interesting to see how this proposal actually works in real life. So one other alternative is uh, yeah, block-based approach that we call frequent ordering auction where we take all the transactions that kind that come in g time interval so we take them as a batch and sort them by decreasing bits and schedule them uh, by decreasing bits okay so this is simpler and um, to compare them to both satisfy the independence of irrelevant alternatives because we are still looking at the score based uh, function we just look at the transactions so the now score is just transaction bit okay both have low latency uh, actually uh, frequent order auction has on average half latency of the uh, time boost proposal so this uh, uh, the proposal that i discussed so far the only disadvantage that uh, frequent uh, ordering auction has is that it allows low bit to make in the early bit, uh, early block, and then the high bit uh, transaction that didn't make it to early block just loses the race. But uh, as I said, any block based or time based, only time based approach would, would have this problem, and this also has. Uh, but there is also Another aspect of uh, this alternative proposal, it's much easier to decentralize. So there are trade-offs between them, and I think it's very interesting to see which which one is performing better in the practice. So that's all from my side. Thank you for the attention. If you have any questions, happy to answer. Thanks so much for joining, Kagi. Really appreciate it. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I think if you have any, you can just uh, unmute and go ahead and shout out. Um, well, I guess it looks like we, we don't have any questions. <laughs> uh, I, I, in that case, thank you so much for joining us, Kagi. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. See you, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Oh, uh, does anybody have a question? I saw one raise hand. Um, okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you guys.